you for uh, just the wonderful welcome I've had on the campus of uh, Biola University. Great to be in sunny California with the beautiful people on this campus. If you weren't with us on uh, Monday, I've been talking about the coming of the kingdom of God, and our message on Monday had to do with anticipating the kingdom's arrival. Uh, if you weren't here for that chapel, maybe you saw the, uh, the feed, uh, the, the Twitter feed for Biola Chapel. Here's what it said. Listen carefully. Wheaton President Philip Ryken on the coming kingdom and how we are to live in the knowledge that Christ may come at any time, he returns Wednesday. <laughs> so... So I just want to explain, I apparently it didn't come through clearly uh, to Todd Pickett. We're, we're not sure when Jesus is going to come. Uh, it could be today, but we're not absolutely uh, certain about that. Uh, this morning I want to speak with you about seeking the kingdom's priorities. Because whether Jesus returns today or tomorrow or the day after that, whenever he returns... Our hope should be that he will find us pursuing the values of his kingdom, seeking its priorities. Now, I said on Monday that the kingdom is very near. I said this because Jesus said it and said it repeatedly. The kingdom of God has come near to you. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And uh, when some people hear this, they want to know exactly how near the kingdom is. And their main interest is in the timing of the kingdom. I think, for example, of a cartoon I saw, it depicted two men on a sidewalk, each of them holding a sign about the coming of the kingdom. And one man had a sign that said, the end is near. And the other guy had a sign that said, the end is Thursday. Uh, the guy with the sign that said, the end is near, leave, leaving things somewhat open-ended, looked at the other guy who was pinning himself down to a particular day, and he said, amateur because uh, if you want to be in the kingdom as near business, uh, it always needs to be near but not pinned down to a particular day. Some people are very interested in the timing of the coming of the kingdom. But I want to consider a question with you this morning that I think is even more important than its timing. I want to ask whether we even want the kingdom to come. Oh, we may say that we are living for Christ, that we are seeking his kingdom, but I think the reality is that we are often tempted to pursue an alternative dominion. And the reason for that is very simple. We would rather rule our own lives than submit to the sovereignty of God. If you say that Christ is king, then you acknowledge his authority over every aspect of life. That's what a king is. It's someone who rules. And so if Christ is king, then he has a right to rule over every aspect of our lives over our wardrobe, over our uh, course choices, over our plans for Thanksgiving and Christmas, over our cell phone use, over our friend group. There's, there's no part of life that we can say to God, this is for me, God, and it's not for you. And so as we consider the kingship of Christ, I think the issue for us is not so much when his kingdom will come, but whether we want it to come at all. Now, we've been singing together this morning that we do want that. Take my life and let it be all for your glory. But is that really what we desire? Well, one way to illustrate the choice that, that confronts each one of us is to consider a verse from the Old Testament, which I think is one of the most brutally honest verses in the Bible. Now, let me uh, invite you to turn in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 1. We won't do everything that we could do with this passage, but I want you to notice one verse in particular and a little bit about its context. It's a story that comes from the time of Solomon, just as he was about to come into his kingdom. But it was in the last days of King David, and he was so old that he was having trouble keeping warm at night but his kingdom had not yet come to an end, and David had a son who wanted the kingdom for himself. It was Adonijah. He was the oldest. And at some level, he knew that his younger brother Solomon would be anointed to be king, but he didn't want to submit to God. He wanted his own kingdom. And so notice what is said in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5. 
Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. I look at what Adonijah said in this verse, it reminds me a little bit of something that happens in the game of checkers. I don't know if anybody still plays checkers anymore, but if you know checkers, you know that if you manage to maneuver your piece, moving and jumping to the far side of the board, there comes a time in the game when one of the ordinary playing pieces suddenly becomes royalty. Your checker reaches the far side and you say, king me. Somebody puts that extra checker on top of the first checker and now you can move all over the board. That's really what Adonijah was saying. King me. Mine is the kingdom. I will be the king. Not even waiting for his father to die, he tried to take by force and by influence and by manipulation something that was only God's to give. Not submitting to God's kingdom, he was seeking his own kingdom by his own power for his own glory. Rather than saying, thy kingdom come, he said, mine is the kingdom. I wonder, do you ever feel that same temptation? To take what you want, when you want it, rather than waiting for what God wants to give you. Because I think in one way or another, all of us are tempted to exalt ourselves. But, but understand that when you put yourself on the throne, then God is no longer the king. He has only become one of your servants. So often, rather than seeking his kingdom, we, whether we say it openly or not, expect God to seek our kingdom. And what happens when we do that, if we decide to king ourselves, is sooner or later we become angry with God about something that he's not doing or is doing in our lives. We, and, and I think we should recognize this when we're angry at the world or angry with other people or angry with other circumstances. What's really behind it is because we have the wrong person on the throne. I think it's instructive to notice the way in which Adonijah exalted himself. Scripture says that he started by gathering horses and chariots with a charioteer, charioteer to drive each one of those chariots and 50 men to run before him. If you want people to know how important you are, it really helps to have your own entourage, and that way, even before you arrive, people know that somebody important is on the way. So I look at this scene from the Old Testament. I'm reminded of something that happened my freshman year of high school. Our class was trying to raise funds, and we had set up an auction where various members of the freshman class uh, sold their services as slaves for a day. Uh, probably people wouldn't let you do that anymore, but this was back in the 1980s. And uh, there was an enterprising sophomore that went to the auction and uh, put down some chump change to uh, hire three or four reasonably muscular freshman football players, and then paid top dollar for some of the prettiest girls in the freshman class, and was all in preparation for his grand entrance the next morning. Uh, I was sitting there in French class, and he came in, carried up on a litter by the, uh, by the freshman football players, and the girls were there feeding him grapes by hand and uh, waving palm fronds like some kind of teenage pharaoh. Well, that's in effect what Adonijah did. He hired people to be his posse. Image is everything. And so Adonijah made sure that he had the support of some of the leading political and military and religious figures in Israel. And then you see this if you look down in verse 9. He made a, a public display of his personal wealth and religious commitment. He sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle. He invited his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah. Basically, he was staging his own coronation. He was getting the right people on his side, killing the fatted calf, throwing a huge party, and at the same time, by making all of these animal sacrifices, he was wanting to give the impression that he was a deeply religious man, and yet he was really doing it all for himself. What makes this particularly ironic is that the name Adonijah means God is master, and yet Adonijah wanted to be the master of his own life. He never submitted to the kingdom of God. And I put it to you this morning that we ourselves are tempted to king ourselves in the same way. We try to, 
impress people with what we have or who we know or what we have accomplished or maybe how much we're doing for God. And we like to have people around us who will tell us the things that we want to hear. They'll reinforce our attitudes and affirm our choices and support our ambitions and commend our expenditures without ever challenging our priorities or correcting our sins. And we may not ride a chariot to do it or hire 50 servants or invite celebrities over for dinner, but we do it in other ways. We maybe let people know our grades or show off our latest purchases or we do whatever it is that people do in our community to keep score. Maybe, maybe we simply fuel our own sense of importance by complaining about the heavy workload that we have. There are all ways of saying, I'm the really important person here. Mine is the kingdom. Trying to give people the impression we are something more than we really are. Well, I'm here this morning to say that as servants of Christ, we are called to seek a different kingdom. To help us see how to do that, I want to mention by name specifically, I want to call them out some of the kingdoms that we are tempted to seek instead. The better we understand these temptations, I think, the more consistently we will be able to live for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so for starters, here's the first of four other kingdoms I want to mention. Some of us are tempted to to seek the kingdom of success. What makes us really feel good in life is being recognized for our achievement. And it's hard for us really to be happy unless we get the grade we think we deserve or have the, give, offer the performance that we think we're capable of offering or win the game that we counted on winning. And maybe we thought that we were involved in academic life or musical performance or sports ultimately for the glory of God, but when we fail to live up to that standard, we quickly discover it really wasn't for God after all, it was for ourselves. I wonder, have you learned how to be second best at something for the glory of God, if that's to the best of your ability? Or does it kill you to know that someone else is better? It's a sign that we're pursuing the kingdom of success. Most of us are also tempted to pursue what Mark Buchanan has called the kingdom of stuff. We live in a culture that believes there is always something you can buy that will make you happy. Just look at the way that advertising sells happiness for the price of a new pair of sneakers. Or better yet, think about all of the stuff that you brought to college this fall. Or all of the stuff that at the end of the semester or the end of the year you will end up dumping or storing or leaving behind. Most of us have more personal possessions in our bedrooms than the average third world family has in their entire home, if they even have a home, which many people don't. I'm not saying that it's wrong to own property any more than I'm saying it's wrong to have success in life, but I am saying that it's tempting to worship things that we can buy. We give them our time. They occupy our thoughts. We pay them our money. We use them to establish our identity, which I think is really a way of saying that we worship them. And when we pursue the kingdom of stuff, we are seeking the wrong kingdom. Then there is the kingdom of sex. This, too, is something we are tempted to worship. Whether they are gay or straight, most people in our culture claim the right to use their bodies any way that they please. And thus they are offended by the very idea that anyone else has the right to tell them how they should use or shouldn't use their sexual parts, even even God Almighty. There was a recent example on the news in a television talk show with Piers Morgan they were, it was a conversation with a, a well-known pastor about sexuality and sexual behavior, and here's what Piers Morgan said. When it comes to sex, we need to, quote, unquote, move with the times and drag the Bible kicking and screaming into the modern world. I think it was really a way of saying that sex is sovereign, not God, not his word. These are some of the kingdoms that we're tempted to pursue, the kingdom of sex, the kingdom of stuff, the kingdom of success. And then let me add one more to that list. It may be the biggest kingdom of all. It's just the kingdom of self. What keeps us from saying to God, yours is the kingdom, is our stubborn insistence on saying, mine is the kingdom. 
Give me the choice, and I want to pursue my own pleasure, choose my own entertainment, control my own schedule, determine my own destiny. A couple of years ago, in a kind of whimsical moment, I took the old hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and wrote a paraphrase that went like this, showing the way that a lot of us think about God. Have mine own way, Lord. Have mine own way. Let me be in charge here at least for today. I really don't need you. Say what you will. I've got my own plan, Lord. You can just chill. Now, most of us wouldn't put it that bluntly, but we often operate that way, as if we are on the throne and God ought to be serving us, and we do this because we are so in love with ourselves. Not long ago, I was speaking to a floor fellowship at Wheaton College. It was Sunday evening, a floor full of guys from one of the dormitories, and I was asked what my biggest regret from my time in college was. I was a student at Wheaton. They were interested in my experience there. You know, was there a summer program that I I wished I had gotten involved in, maybe some campus activity? I, I said, frankly, the first thing I think of, my biggest regret from my college years is that I was so in love with myself that I couldn't really love others the way that Jesus loves them. I look back at how selfish I was in those years, and I think of the affection that I have for my classmates now, and I I say, that's my regret. I, I wish I was at a place in my spiritual experience that I really could have loved other people the way that Jesus wants me to love them. And it's, it's a struggle for us, and it's all because of our love for ourselves, that deep and abiding, passionate love affair that we have all through life. It's part of the kingdom of self. Well, there's a different kingdom that God wants us to seek, It's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than crowning ourselves, Jesus wants us to submit to his sovereign rule. He wants us to swear allegiance to his kingship. He wants us to surrender everything we are, everything we have to him and put his kingdom first. You know surely what Jesus said to his disciples, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness And with that command, with that imperative, comes a wonderful promise. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. When Jesus spoke about these things, he was talking about all of the things that his disciples were worried about, food, clothing, the necessities of daily life. And he was saying, look, if you pursue my kingdom, then my Father will give you everything that you truly need. But now what does it mean for us to seek the kingdom? I want to go back to the kingdoms I mentioned earlier, the kingdoms that we are tempted to to serve and pursue in life, the kingdoms that get in the way for us of the kingdom of God. I want to just show you briefly how each of those areas of life gets totally transformed when we surrender it to the kingship of Christ. Let's start with success. What happens when we surrender that idol of success to the kingship of Christ, the main thing that ought to happen is this, that we will no longer base our identity on what we achieve or fail to achieve, but instead find our fundamental identity in this, that we have a king who loves us and who gave himself for us. Here is something that no other religion can claim, that God himself has come in the person of his son to live the life that we could never live, to die the death that we deserve to die, and then to come back from that death with the power of resurrection life. Our king has done all of that for us. He has lived for us. He has died for us. He has risen again for us. And so we no longer live to gain anything for ourselves. For us, success simply means being faithful, faithful to use the gifts that we've been given to the best of our ability to do that for Jesus, and then to leave him in charge of all the results, whatever they may be. Then let's talk about our stuff. If we're living for the right kingdom, then every choice that we make about our material possessions ought to be driven by our commitment to Christ. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, and therefore we have this very simple criterion that we can use in making decisions about what to spend. Can I buy this for Christ and for his kingdom. And so instead of 
asking ourselves questions like, do I look good in this? Or would that be fun to do? We'll ask deeper questions like, how will this affect my relationships with other people, both inside and outside the body of Christ? Or given the the worldwide work of the kingdom of God and the progress of the gospel around the globe, is this the best way to use this money? Unless we ask those kinds of questions, it'll be hard for us to exercise good stewardship, and at the same time, it'll be very easy for us to be discontent. Unless we think carefully about our stewardship, we will always want more. We will never be satisfied with what we have. Listen, the way to be content is not by getting more of what you think you want, but by knowing when to say enough is enough. One good way to test whether we are living for the kingdom of stuff is to consider how often we say thank you to God. I wonder when you go into the cafeteria today, will you take a moment quietly by yourself or perhaps with friends to thank God for the amazing, abundant provision of food that you have on this campus with all of its choices? When you go to your dorm room, will you look around and offer praise to God for your clothing and your books and maybe your computer and whatever furniture you have and say, Lord, thank you for all of these blessings. Earlier I mentioned Mark Buchanan. He writes about visiting a little township in Uganda and the local congregation there had gathered to worship on a dirt floor under a tin roof in a lean-to on the edge of a cornfield. And one Sunday, the the pastor of that congregation asked if, anything, if anyone had anything to share. One woman stood up and said, Oh, brothers and sisters, I love Jesus so much. Tell us, sister, they said. Tell us. Oh, I love him so much. I don't know where to begin to tell you how good he is. Begin there, sister, they said. Begin right there. Oh, he is so good to me. I praise him all the time for how good he is to me. For three months, I prayed to the Lord for shoes. And look, the woman lifted her leg so everyone could see her foot covered with a, as it seemed to Buchanan, ordinary looking shoe. He gave me shoes. Hallelujah. He is so good. And while the congregation was praising the Lord, Buchanan sat there devastated I sat there, he wrote, hollowed out, hammered down, and all my life I had not once prayed for shoes, and in all my life I had not once thanked God for the many, many shoes I had. You see, using our stuff for the kingdom of God starts with receiving it as a gift from God, and once you understand that it's a gift, you recognize it's not to be used for yourself, but ultimately for God and for his glory, for his purposes. And of course, our sexuality is designed to be used the same way. Take it for yourself or take it from others, and it will still give you physical pleasure, but it will shrivel your soul. Sex is really about relationships. It is that covenant cement that God has designed to unite one man and one woman in a love relationship for life. I love what the poet Wendell Berry wrote about this. He said, marriage is the way we protect the possibility that sexual love can become a story. And that story is not just about us. It's really about Jesus because the ultimate mystery of sex is to point us to Christ and our romance with him. Seeking God's kingdom in our sexuality means saying, Lord Jesus, I want this part of my life to be what you want it to be, not what I want it to be. Sex is not outside my commitment to your kingdom, but it's inside, and so I surrender my sexual thoughts and my sexual desires and the sexual parts of my body to your sovereignty. Use them to bring me closer to you, not farther away. But if we offer that kind of prayer with our sexuality, why stop there? If we're putting the kingdom first in everything else, if we're seeking the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of sex or stuff or success, then why not offer him our very selves? Why not surrender to him the kingdom of self? For most of us, that's the hardest kingdom to leave behind. The reason we strive for success and accumulate so much stuff 
and violate God's holy standard for sexual purity is because self is on the throne. We're, we're like Adonijah who said, I will be king. Or maybe like Diotrephes described in the New Testament as someone who likes to put himself first. What an epitaph to put on a person. Now here was somebody who liked to put himself first. Brothers and sisters, we need to see ourselves the way that God sees us, as beloved sons and daughters, beloved in Christ, who cannot possibly be any more loved than we are at this present moment in Jesus. And when we understand that, we'll stop thinking so much about ourselves and we'll think more about others and more about the kingdom of God. One man who understood this well, one man who really grasped what it means to seek the kingdom of God and to put that kingdom first was the evangelist John Wesley. I want to close with the prayer that John Wesley offered. It's recorded in the Methodist prayer book and traditionally in many Methodist congregations would have been used as a prayer on the very first morning of the new year. Let's use it at the close of our time in chapel together today. And let me invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And if it's in your heart to offer this prayer to the Lord, Lord, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to doing whatever you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to work doing or suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.